So with that, we'll dive into Egyptomania in Sioux City. Like most kids, I was absolutely fascinated and obsessed with ancient Egypt when I was a kid. I saw a Tutankhamun exhibition when I was a kid in Las Vegas, Nevada with the opening of the Luxor Hotel and Casino. And uh, that kind of spurred my interest in history altogether. So the whole reason I'm standing up here before you today is because of ancient Egypt and my parents' indulgence with buying me books and photos and all of this stuff. And so I'm really, really excited to talk about not only ancient Egypt, which I could nerd about for hours, but to talk about uh, some of those influences that we see here in Sioux City with the Egyptomania movement. So hopefully you guys find this interesting as well. So Egyptomania, I promise I did not pull that term out of nowhere. That is a real thing, it's a real concept, it's a real word. Um, and it refers to just the general resurgence of public interest in ancient Egypt, uh, symbolism and culture and so on and so forth. And Egyptomania especially refers to ancient Egypt's effects on modern trends in popular culture. So art movements, fashion movements, and architecture. Now these surges of Egyptomania often coincide with major archeological events like we're going to talk about today or major historical events. Most of you may be familiar with the 1963 film Cleopatra starring Elizabeth Taylor. And that was released right after the Republic of Egypt had been experiencing a huge period of economic prosperity. Um, hordes of tourists flooded into Egypt to uh, check out the sites and the monuments and the tombs and so on and so forth. So um, we're not gonna get into the 1960s surge of Egyptomania in this talk, um, but that was just one example of how these affect um, cultures all around the world. So the term Egyptomania was actually coined after Napoleon Bonaparte's Egyptian campaigns, which occurred from 1792 to 1801. However, Egypt is really, really old. And so the concept of being obsessed with this ancient Egyptian symbolism and architecture actually goes back much, much farther, back to the Romans and maybe even to the Greeks. Um, great example of this is this statue here. This is a Roman statue of the god Nilus which is the Roman god of the Nile. I say Roman god, this guy is not Egyptian. He has no concept, <laughs> uh, no relation to any ancient Egyptian god whatsoever. This statue once sat in the city of Rome at the temple of Isis and Serapis. Now Isis is definitely an ancient Egyptian god. Uh, and Serapis, it's complicated, but this is kind of another concept god like Nihilus that the Romans invented to help explain why Egypt is the way it is. So this is not a new thing, this obsession with ancient Egypt. Um, even ancient uh, cultures that are ancient to us are looking at Egypt and going, wow, this stuff is really cool and really old. Um, there's something about Egypt that just captures our imagination. One of the largest surges of Egyptomania came after the discovery of King Tutankhamun which was in November 1922. And for those of you who are good at math, this year is the 100th anniversary of that discovery, which is why I'm talking to you guys today. I'll get to the uh, main body of the discovery of the tomb a little bit later because you guys are stuck here and I love to geek out about that. <laughs> um, but here you can see a shot of the tomb antechamber as it would have appeared when archeologists first discovered Tutankhamun's tomb in November 1922. And with these surges of Egyptomania, we get the rise of Egyptian revival architecture. Um, you can see it in uh, early, on, uh, early on in some of the earlier surges of Egyptomania, like the Egyptian building in Richmond, Virginia, built in 1845. And after that discovery of Tut, you actually get uh, things like this Egyptian theater in Illinois, which was built between 1928 and 1929. I chose architecture to focus on, number one, because I can see Egyptian symbols in Sioux City's architecture. Um, however, architecture tends to be something that lasts, lasts a lot longer than things like uh, film or novels or um, fashion and art movements and so on and so forth. And so um, because architecture is so long standing and because I can see it here, we're gonna be focusing largely on architecture today. Um, but sometimes we get Egyptian looking buildings that have nothing to do with any surge of Egyptomania, like the Luxor Hotel that I mentioned earlier, or the pyramid shaped Wilson trailer headquarters uh, right here in Sioux City on Lewis Boulevard. Um, Egyptian architecture tends to be very unique, and so when somebody wants to be unique or different, um, they'll often pull in Egyptian symbols like pyramids. 
And I'm not pulling that out of nothing, by the way. That's actually what the architect of Wilson Trailer was trying to do when he built it this way. He's like, I wanted it to look different. So I'm going to start off with just an introduction to some of the most common Egyptian symbols that you're going to see. That way I can just talk about all of the symbolism all at once, and I don't have to repeat myself 100 times when I see it on buildings. Um, and where you're going to see a lot of these is in our cemeteries. Because of the whole mummy and tombs thing, um, ancient Egypt naturally lends itself to uh, grave markers and other similar symbolism in cemeteries. Um, so we're going to take a walk around Sioux City cemeteries for a little bit and check out some of these symbols. So probably the most recognizable Egyptian monument that you can find are obelisks. These are um, long pillars topped with pyramids at the top. Obelisks represent the mound of creation. In the ancient Egyptian creation myth, the gods actually rose the earth out of the primordial marsh of creation. And in a similar way, an obelisk can kind of uh, lift the dead up into the heavens to reside with the gods. That was the ultimate goal when you died in ancient Egypt. Um, because they are topped with a pyramid, pyramids have very much of the same symbolism as obelisks do. So you're going to see these very things in like the Great Pyramids of Giza, for example, were built with this exact same purpose. Um, though obelisks usually weren't used in ancient Egypt to denote um, grave sites or tombs. They were usually denoting temples um, and usually built in direct sunlight. And, and so they're very common around sun temples. In fact, there are certain sources that even call obelisks a petrified sun ray, a very ray of sunlight that was turned into stone and then covered in hieroglyphics. And they are everywhere and so prominent because when Egypt was occupied by the Greeks and the Romans um, and later European colonials uh, took advantage of this as well, they looked at these giant stone obelisks and, and was like, hey, you know where that would look really awesome? My garden. <laughs> and so these got spread everywhere. That's um, part of how you get things like the two Cleopatra's needles, one in London which you can see here on the left, and one in New York, which you can see on the right. I have seen the one in London. I have not seen the one in New York. Um, but these are actual ancient Egyptian obelisks. They were built by King Tutmosis III around 1450 BCE, uh, which is the same thing as BC, if you're not familiar with that. Just It's a different way of notating. But BC and BCE are the same thing. Um, so these are real ancient Egyptian obelisks that were built near modern Cairo. And because of political circumstances, one of them is now in London, and one of them is now in New York. Sioux City's, of course, most famous obelisk is the Floyd Monument, built in 1901. Here in this image, you can see the opening ceremonies right after the Floyd Monument was completed. In the insert there, you can see our illustrious mayor, D.A. McGee, in his nice little bowler hat, looking on as the pyramid top of the obelisk of the Floyd Monument is finished. But if you walk around Sioux City cemeteries, besides Memorial Park anyway, you will see obelisks everywhere. They're usually really, really big, um, and they tend to really, really stand out as you're driving around. You'll see these giant spires going up into the air. Um, so pretty much every uh, Sioux City cemetery that you walk around, you're going to see these obelisks. Next up, we have the Jed Pillar. This is a very simple pillar that has these four horizontal lines going across it. That's how you know you're looking at a Jed. The Jed Pillar represents the backbone of Osiris, which was a very, very important ancient Egyptian god of the dead. However, it has very a lot of other interpretations, too, because the Jed symbol is very, very old. Jeds symbolize stability, permanence, and everlasting life. Um, as appropriate with a Egyptian god of the dead, and the, uh, the whole idea of making mummies was so that the spirit could live on, um, and so that's why we have the symbolism tied into here. This makes the jet very common in things like amulets, which you can see here, these am amulets once adorned Tutankhamun's mummy, um, and you often see them in structures, and a lot of, you're gonna see a lot of structural jets around Sioux City when we get to that section of the talk. Here you can see some jed pillars adorning a temple at Saqqara. Saqqara is one of ancient Egypt's oldest grave sites. So you're going to see pyramids there, you'll see uh, temples, and you'll see all kinds of tombs. Um, this one is at a temple. And you can see these long pillars here with those horizontal lines going across. Um, those are jed pillars. And once you recognize them, you'll start to see them everywhere. 
most jed pillars in modern architecture, so in the Egyptomania, Egyptian revival movements of architecture, they are extremely stylized. And so they're kind of changed around to look a little bit different than their ancient Egyptian counterparts. For example, Memorial Park's Tower of Legends. What I look for is that long, big tower with those horizontal lines right here going across it. That, to me, looks a lot like a jed pillar. Now, I'm not saying that uh, the architect who designed Memorial Park was like, I'm going to put a jed pillar into my uh, tower here because it's the ancient Egyptian symbol of stability and permanence and yada. No, often we're not seeing, I'm not trying to argue that architects intended to use jeds whenever they appear in these examples. But architects often follow style guides and these styles and how, of the, uh, how these kind of carry on over time often have ties to ancient Egypt. And sometimes they look so much like a jed or like an ancient Egyptian symbol that I can't help but point it out. For example, at the Roth Fountain, right here in downtown Sioux City, right outside of the Promenade Theater, outside of Mardo Brewing Company, looks very, very much like a jed to me. This is where a uh, most common form of jed, where you have a brick structure and then you have these stylized brick courses going across horizontally. That's where I tend to see a lot of our jeds around here in Sioux City. And even the main body of the fountain itself, you can kind of see, looks very much like a jed pillar, not just the surrounding pillars on the outside. Um, but even the fountains itself kind of uh, lends its own style and design to a jed pillar symbol. Next we have, uh, you're going to see a lot of buildings around here that just kind of resemble ancient Egyptian tombs and temples. So just the general shape of how these are constructed. Uh, for example, one of the uh, oldest tombs in ancient Egypt is a mastaba. Uh, this is a structure that has a flat roof on top and sloping sides down, so kind of looking like a trapezoid. And then underneath that structure is a system of tunnels where the actual burial chambers are. So these are most common in ex very, very old uh, burials as well as burials of like high officials. So if you have the king in like a pyramid, we're going to have his grand vizier and maybe like his family inside of these mastabas. Like the Jed, Mastabas represent stability and permanence. And you can see one here uh, in Saqqara, again, that very old grave site of ancient Egypt. Now, ancient Egypt's very first pyramids were step pyramids, like the step pyramid of Djoser. And you can see these are just Mastabas that have been stacked on top of each other. So a series of smaller Mastabas going up create your step pyramids. And these bear a very striking resemblance to a structure in ancient Mesopotamia, which is a totally different ancient culture, called ziggurats. Um, here you can see uh, kind of a high example of a ziggurat. This is the ziggurat of Ur. And you can see the, the tiers are what I mainly want to focus on um, because people were taking this kind of tiered structure and doing all kinds of really cool things with it in various architecture movements. And that really makes them more and more resemble ancient Egyptian structures. So for, for example, during the Art Deco movement, during the 1920s and 1930s, if you like Art Deco, by the way, um, check out Tom's talk next month, because he'll be talking about all about Art Deco here in Sioux City. Um, but during the Art Deco movement, architects took this tiered style and created what they called ziggurat skyscrapers. You can see it very well in Lincoln and the Nebraska Capitol building. Anywhere where you see this long horizontal building with these little zigzaggy tiers going up that central tower. These are uh, what we call ziggurat skyscrapers. The Empire State Building kind of has this as well, though its tiers are less sharply defined, simply because in New York, real estate's a little bit more expensive. So you got to build up, not out. Um, but you'll see these ziggurat skyscrapers, and they very much resemble the old step pyramids and the old ziggurats of Mesopotamia. Other common elements of Egyptian temples that you will see in modern architecture are pylons. So these are the lo uh, large kind of trapezoidal square towers that surround gateways. Those are pylons. You'll see those every now and then. Into those pylons and into temples are often niches. So these are just shallow grooves carved into a wall, like you can see here. And sometimes they will fill those niches uh, with s giant statues. So like the Colossus statues at Abba Simbel of Rev Ramses the Great. That's one example of the statuary and niches. Pretty recognizable one are the cavetto. So above entryways, typically, you'll see the cornice 
sloping down to the main body of the wall. So this cavetta right here, it kind of curves down rather than ending in a sharp geometric right angle. It slopes down into the main body of the wall. And you'll often see like paintings. This one has a winged sun disk, a very important symbol in ancient Egypt. And the two cobras on the side are called Uraeus cobras, or Urei, plural. Um, so you'll see that around as well. Anytime you uh, see large uh, figures, especially large figures carved in reliefs, so not actually inside in the stone, but sticking out from the main body of the wall or the stone, um, those are relief carvings, and they're, again, very much associated with ancient Egypt. You can see some of them here on this temple wall. And columns. Egyptian columns are very, very unique. Um, and so columns and colonnades frequently adorn temples, and you'll see those colonnades copied elsewhere. I'll talk more about columns a little bit later. Um, but you'll, uh, any anytime you see columns and structures like this, very much lends itself to an Egyptian temple. Where you can see a lot of these elements most uh, amicably is on the L.G. Everest Memorial in Graceland Cemetery. Again, those nice tiers, almost like a ziggurat skyscraper with the horizontal and then that central tower sticking up there. Everest actually has a cavetto on the top of his tower with another ring, uh, wing sun disk with two Urei cobras. And these lotus flowers here are carved into, in relief. So kind of an example of a bunch of these elements coming together in one piece of modern architecture. Another great place you can see it is the Calvary Cemetery Mausoleum. Um, this exactly looks to me like a ziggurat skyscraper that just had its tower cut off. Uh, but you notice that low horizontal, these two pylon towers on either side, those uh, towers in the entryway end in cavettos, those nice little sloping things going up into the cornice. And there's columns all around this thing. So speaking of columns, um, Egyptian columns tend to look pretty different from other cultures' columns. Um, there are nine principal capital types that we associate with ancient Egypt. I'm only going to really talk about three of them. One is the papyrus flower, which represents the marsh of creation, so the uh, kind of primordial marsh that the mound of creation rose out of. Papyruses grow in marsh, so that makes sense. The lotus flower, or the water lily, which symbolizes rebirth. The lotus is especially important because it resembles a sun coming up over the horizon as its petals kind of fan out. And so you'll see a lot of lotus flower capitals as well. And you'll also see the Egyptian palm, which represents the sun of the uh, seat of the sun god and also generally just represents kingship or the ancient Egyptian pharaohs. I always mix up the Egyptian palm with the ostrich feather symbol, which is another capital type. Um, so I'll tend to kind of use them interchangeably because they look so similar. I can't honestly say this one's a palm and this one's an ostrich feather. So just know that they mean the same thing um, and the, they share symbolism. So I might interchange them a little bit. Outside of Calvary Cemetery, you can see these nice papyrus flower um, kind of bell out at the, at the bottom and then curve up into the top. So that is a closed bell papyrus flower is what we call that. And then these are simpler columns. They don't actually have any special capitals, but that bell shape much more represents a lotus. And so those, uh, that's another style of Egyptian column. For true ancient Egyptian columns, this is the uh, Temple of Luxor, and these are traditional papyrus flowers there on the left. Papyrus columns often look like uh, bundles of sticks that have been wrapped together. And so you can see that throughout the body here. And then the closed papyrus flower on top that is actually supporting uh, the upper structure. And then for lotus columns, you can see some very stylized ones here at the Temple of Philae in ancient Egypt. And right over here on the far right of your screen there is one of those Egyptian palm or ostrich feather. Again, I can't, I'm not very good at telling the difference. <laughs> um, but anytime you see kind of columns that are belling out like that, it's a very Egyptian way of building a column. Now, of course, not all columns are Egyptian. And you much more often, especially around here in Sioux City, see Greek columns over Egyptian columns. So what's the difference? How do you tell the difference between the two? Well, Greek columns tend to be very flat on top. They end in a strict horizontal line. They tend to have a fluted body, which means it's grooved. So those little grooves that you see around a Grecian column, those are called flutes. Sometimes the capitals will have these swirly things called volutes, so that snail uh, shell swirl that you see on the top of many columns, like the ones here at First National Bank, the old First National Bank anyway, the little memorial that's uh, on 
Pierce Street now. Um, those are called volutes. And their capitals are very, very strictly defined. The most common uh, styles you'll see are Doric, Ionian, and Corinthian Greek capitals. Um, and there are very, very strict rules that architects and styles have to follow in order to fall into those categories. Now with Egyptian columns, they have more of a flare or again, that belled out lotus flower. And you can see a example of a flared one here on the Woodbury County Courthouse. And notice that lovely jed pillar coursework right underneath that capital. The bodies of Egyptian columns tend to be very smooth or uh, often they'll have symbols or hieroglyphs carved into them so they won't have the flutes like you see in a Greek column. And the capitals are a lot more loosey-goosey. You can combine capitals with other art forms, other styles. Um, you don't have to follow as strict of rules that you do with a Greek capital. So now that we've got the basic symbolism out of the way, we'll go into Egyptomania architecture and Egyptian revival before 1922, so pre-Tutankhamun um, Egyptian revival stuff. And this uh, in Sioux City goes from about 1887 up to 19, the early 1920s. So influences, we have the first wave of Egyptian revival architecture coming in the first half of the 19th century. And uh, this is spurred on by discoveries, again, by like Napoleon. Um, when Champollion deciphered hieroglyphics in 1822, that just celebrated its 200th anniversary, by the way, back in September. Um, that led to a lot more architecture and then discoveries by Egyptologists like Henry Salt, Giovanni Belzoni, so on and so forth. Now this wave of Egyptian revival um, in Europe and in the United States was primarily architectural. This is when you see a lot of like sphinx statues going up in Paris, um, some of the obelisks that were uh, built around the world, um, and you see it in the eastern United States as well. For example, the Washington Monument. When it was originally designed, it was just a giant Egyptian obelisk surrounded by a Greek temple. And today, of course, the Washington Monument is much more of a standard obelisk. Um, so this revival was extremely important architecturally, however, it all occurs before Sioux City, <laughs> so I can't spend uh, too much time on it. Where we see more influence uh, here at home in Sioux City with this kind of architecture is in second wave Egyptian revival. And this goes from about 1870 up to, uh, again, the early 1920s. Now this was spurred on by a sudden renewed interest that Americans had in other cultures after our Civil War. Americans were kind of looking around at all of these different cultures and going, wow, these guys have some really cool stuff. Let's, let's build uh, more stuff in this styles. You see this in architecture, you see it in furniture, and you also see it in jewelry. And Egyptian revival was just one of the many, many different revivals that are going on in this time period. Now, Egyptian revival is kept spurred along by numerous uh, Victorian era excavations and projects going on in Egypt. For example, the Suez Canal opened in 1869, connecting the Mediterranean with the uh, Red Sea and down into the Indian Ocean. And you had numerous expeditions by this guy, Sir William Matthew Flinders Petrie, so called the father of Egyptology. He kind of made the discipline of Egyptology what it is today. And he led several important excavations during this era, and some of the most important things ever found in ancient Egypt were done by uh, Petrie. So though this did occur during Sioux City's major boom periods, our architects locally were much more interested in those uniquely American styles, styles that were born right here at home, rather than the revival styles of the ancient cultures. So things like Richardsonian Romanesque, Chicago School, Sullivanesque, Prairie School, like with the Everest House here. Those tend to be something that our architects tend to be more interested in rather than the revivals. So there's not as many examples in this time period, um, but there are a few cool ones. For example, the 1891 Corn Palace, our largest Corn Palace, had the Egyptian room. Um, this picture is already mind boggling. Imagine the fact that all of this is made out of corn and it's like doubly impressive. <laughs> Um, and you see, of course, a lot of overt Egyptian symbolism here. You have the winged sun disk up near the uh, uh, cornice there that curves out into a cavetto. All of these uh, fake hieroglyphic figures. This scene here is actually, I believe, um, an actual scene from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is um, essentially a how-to guide of how we go from dead person to into the gods. Um, and I think it's actually recreating one of those scenes. 
You got a sphinx head over here with an Egyptian palm coming out of it. Yeah, so pretty overt symbolism in this one. We also have the window from the Gerritsen Mansion. Some people might remember the A.S. Gerritsen Mansion down on Morningside Avenue. It was the original branch of the Morningside uh, Branch Public Library. And it had this gigantic window inside of it that has some very overt Egyptian symbolism again. You have Egyptian palm fronds here. These are red lotus flowers, a uh, common flower in Egypt. You had the Nile River in the background with pyramids. There's a camel. Um, and surrounding that scene, you have a winged sun disk with those Uraeus cobras and the lotus flower down here. Now, the Gerritsen Mansion was torn down in 1967, but this window was saved. In 2009, it was preserved by the Bogan Reef Studios, and currently it hangs in our museum gallery over, by the, uh, over by on the back side of the paper. Next, we had the interior, the original interior of the Commerce Building over at 6th and the Nebraska Street, today the Bluebird Flat, Flats. This was built in 1912, and you can see very much Egyptian-style columns throughout the uh, Commerce Building. This is an example of those palm fronds or uh, the ostrich feather tops that you see here. And this is the lounge area of the Commerce Building. Um, and again, you can see those columns. Another thing I wanted to mention is you'll see these big vases everywhere. And these vases are such a weird mix of revival styles. So in this vase, you have an Egyptian palm sticking out of what I think is a Greek vase. I can't see it clear enough to tell what the symbols are, but I think that's a Grecian vase. And it's sitting on top of a pedestal that looks like an oriental dragon. So all just kinds of different exotic revivals going on in this one vase. Now, the Commerce Building did not look like this for very long. By the end of the decade, it had already been remodeled. And I don't know why. I don't know if they were just trying to update it or what went on. Um, so this interior did not last very long. But this was what the original uh, interior of the Commerce Building looked like with these columns. First Congregational Church, um, the building is still there, though it is uh, no longer First Congregational. Uh, this is at 13th and Nebraska Street, built in 1918, designed in the Prairie School style by William Steele. Prairie School doesn't really lend itself too much to Egyptian symbolism. However, if you look at the east facade, so the Nebraska Street side of this building, you will notice these lovely little jed pillars right around the entrance. the Woodbury County Courthouse. So I showed some exterior columns from the courthouse earlier when I was talking about column capitals. You can see those lovely flared columns on the inside as well. So both these big columns here and uh, the smaller columns on that uh, entryway on the uh, balcony there uh, tend to lend themselves much more to Egyptian design than kind of any other culture. If you go outside of the Woodbury County Courthouse and look, uh, go into the entrances on either the north or west side, and you look above you, there's a big metal grate. And if you look at that grate really, really closely, you can see these cool designs. But again, that long pillar with those horizontal lines, there's jed pillars in that little uh, metal grate there. And some other decorative elements on the inside. Uh, some of the courtrooms had these little pyramid-shaped uh, lamps in there originally. And you can see uh, fan details here on some of the architectural details done in terracotta on the courthouse. Um, ostrich fans, again, are a, a huge symbol of kingship in ancient Egypt. And so anytime I see fans, that kind of lends itself to me to be an Egyptian symbol. All right, now geek out time. Uh, so if you were here for architecture, bear with me here for just a moment, because now I get to talk about the actual discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun in November 1922. So who was this kid? Well, why was he so important? Why do I go crazy every time I get to say his name? <laughs> um, so Tutankhamun was born around 1341 BCE, and his original name was Tutankhaten. He was the son of an incredibly controversial monotheistic pharaoh called Akhenaten. Akhenaten wanted to outlaw the worship of any other Egyptian god and turn it to just one god, a god called the Aten, 
which is the sun disk with hands that you can see on this throne detail. Um, again, very controversial, very tumultuous time in ancient Egypt. And so Tutankhamun, when it was his turn to be king, uh, that occurred for him at the tender age of nine. He restored the old gods, moved the capital out of his father's palace and back to Thebes, where it had been before Akhenaten moved it, and uh, led the worship back into uh, ancient Egypt as it had been before his father reigned. And he did this for about 10 years, dying around the age of 19. And all we really know about his death is that it was very unexpected. I would hope so, because he was 19, just a kid. Um, he was buried in a very small tomb, much smaller than we would expect for a king of uh, his time period in the 18th dynasty. And he was buried in a hurry, because all of the stuff in his tomb was kind of tossed around in chaos. Um, so we kind of assume that it was, uh, he was buried in a hurry in a very small tomb, and uh, his death was very unexpected. I promise, by the way, for anybody who is squeamish, you will not see a mummy in this program. So if you're like squeamish about that, don't worry about it. No dead bodies, promise. So Tutankhamun's mummy has undergone various uh, scientific tests. Some of them have been funded by National Geographic, some of them have been funded by the Egyptian government, so on and so forth. I'm talking DNA tests, um, CAT scans, MRIs, all of this stuff. Uh, somebody even made like a 3D reconstruction of him once, yeah. Um, all of these tests have been done, however, no universal cause of his death has ever been universally accepted. We know now that some uh, probable causes of death are more likely than others, um, but no, the scientific community has never come together and said, yes, this is how he died. We just don't know. Um, that's not a mummy, by the way. Uh, Howard Carter is leaning over the third coffin, because I promise, no mummies in this, promise. What made Tutankhamun's tomb most extraordinary and most impressive were the 5,000 plus objects found inside of it. There were treasures, there were boxes, there was furniture, there was vehicles. Um, most of it covered in gold, most of it very expen uh, expensive, most of it not seen by uh, Egyptologists ever before. Um, most of the time when we find tombs in ancient Egypt, especially back then, um, they'd already been plundered. Tomb robbers had come down and stolen all of the treasures and oftentimes stolen the mummies as well. Um, but Tut's wasn't plundered for the most part. Um, all of the stuff was still in there. And so that's really what made it uh, so impressive was all of the things that we found in Tut's tomb. So who found it? Well, this guy. Uh, Howard Carter was an English archaeologist, and he was active from 1891 until 1932. So right after the Tut uh, excavation, he decided he was done, and I don't blame him. Um, he trained under Sir Flinders Petrie, that father of Egyptology I talked about. And in 1907, he began working with this guy, the Earl of Carnarvon. This was an English noble who was just fascinated by Egyptology, and like most English nobles at the time, he wanted to send archaeologists down into Egypt to uh, find cool stuff to put in his house. Um, that's how archaeology was mostly done back then. <laughs> um, so he mostly had Carter digging around Thebes and trying to find aunts and ends and antiques here and there um, for those purposes. But right across from Thebes where Carter was digging, we have the Valley of the Kings, so named because it's a big valley where a lot of e Egyptian royal burials have been found. Um, so in 1912, the valley was actually declared exhausted. Archaeologists believed they had found everything that was to be found in the Valley of the Kings, which is insane because the Valley of the Kings is still being excavated today and they're still finding things. So this is very premature. Um, so Carter had studied evidence for what he thought to be a totally intact burial, what would have been the holy grail for Egyptologists at the time. And so he talked to Carnarvon and got funding for a dig near the tomb of Ramses VI. So in this right picture here, that uh, entryway you see right in the middle, that's the tomb of Ramses VI, and this red circle is where Carter dug his test pits, trying to find um, evidence for this intact tomb. He didn't actually find it up here, he ended up finding it down where these boxes are. That's the actual entrance to Tutankhamun's tomb, because this picture was taken after it had already been found. So Carter dug and dug for three years and found almost nothing for all of his efforts. 
Um, he begged Carnarvon for just one more season, one more season for him to find this, and then he was going to give up on the whole matter entirely. And so finally, on November 4th, 1922, Carter's team uncovered a set of steps dug into the limestone rock that they were digging in. They uncovered all of these steps and finally found a doorway covered in what are called burial seals. And because uh, these seals, and you can see a close-up on this hunk of doorway on the right here, because these seals were totally intact, that led Carter's team to believe that the tomb beyond had never, ever been entered since it was built. And so weeks passed um, just because of financial things. And so finally, on November 27th, 1922, Carter and his team entered the first room of the tomb, what they called the antechamber. And these uh, colorized images kind of show you what they must have seen the first time they entered this tomb. Um, Carter famously said, I see wonderful things, the first time he uh, gazed upon the antechamber. I like this quote from his journal better. We were astonished by the beauty and refinement of the art displayed by the objects, surpassing all that we could have imagined. The impression was overwhelming. So a layout of the tomb. Um, so that antechamber that I was talking about, that is this front right here, leading out of the, uh, uh, out of the main entryway there. Behind the antechamber was something called the annex. And the annex was just kind of a fold of a hodgepodge of random furniture and boat parts and so on and so forth. So that's this right here, right behind the antechamber. Beyond the two guardian statues of the uh, antechamber on your right here is the burial chamber. That's where the actual sarcophagus and coffins and mummy of Tutankhamun was found. And they're still there to this day. Carter left the mummy uh, intact in one of the coffins and left it inside of there. And uh, it remains there to this day, except when it's taken out to get studied. And beyond the burial chamber, you have the treasury. This held the famous Anubis statue, um, the Canopic Shrine, several of the treasures, boxes, so on and so forth. One of my favorite things about uh, Tut's tomb was the burial chamber. So the burial chamber was totally full of these gigantic wooden shrines that were entirely covered in gold. And they were so big, they completely filled the room beyond, and they had to be dismantled for Carter's team to get access to the sarcophagus. Um, so this is an image of Carter working out how to dismantle these and uh, him kind of in the process of opening the doors and uh, getting inside of there. I cannot imagine what kind of engineering in 1922 this would have taken to uh, get this stuff out of here. A nearby tomb, as artifacts were cleared out, they took them to a nearby empty tomb uh, for use as a laboratory. And this is where Egyptologist Arthur Mace and a chemist named Alfred Lucas did, uh, did the basic preservation work. So uh, getting the objects in a stable enough state for their long, long journey up the river to Cairo. The tomb had several open houses, because that is how you did archaeology back in the day. It was a big public event where you invited people to come and see what you were doing. Yeah, that's not really how we do it today, by the way. <laughs> um, and so you had uh, m hundreds of people coming down to see this. Uh, everyone from European royalty to uh, just kind of random people around the street. Um, of course, the press was invited to uh, write about this. P uh, Flinders Petrie himself, you can see, in that left image there, right in the center. He came down and visited the tomb. A Sucidian named A.J. Moore, he was a druggist, he visited the tomb. I found an article in the Sioux City Journal of his visit to the tomb in March of 1923. And after the press release, after all of these open houses, we get the Tut Mania period. So this is the Egyptomania and Egyptian revival architecture that occurred from 1922 and through the 1930s. So naturally, the Sioux City Journal kept the local public informed of the excavation's progress. Uh, these are just some examples of articles that were going on as the tomb was being cleared out. But it also provides some really interesting look at the Egyptomania and Tutmania that is going on during the 20s and 30s. On the right here, you can see a big uh, 
excerpt from a New York fashion magazine of how to dress like an Egyptian, how to find the latest Egyptian fashions. Um, this is an article about the new tut bob that is sweeping the nation for women's hair, <laughs> um, so on and so forth. These are ads from local department stores. So Davidson Brothers, T.S. Martins, and Pelletiers. Um, they are selling things like Egyptian velour furniture, um, Egyptian design jackets, Egyptian design Easter dresses. The Davidson Brothers was selling uh, King Tut routine in their wash goods section. Um, so Sioux City is not exempt from this Tut mania that's going on. And, but where you see it most often and most extraordinarily is in Egyptian revival architecture. So these uh, flooded back into popularity after the discovery of the tomb, and they're often combined with styles like Art Deco, as I've mentioned before. So like the Lincoln Theater out in Columbus, Ohio, um, this very standard Art Deco exterior, but if you go inside into the stage, you see these amazing Egyptian columns and Egyptian symbolism. So what are the examples here in Sioux City? So right away in 1922, you have the Masonic Temple built at 9th and Nebraska Street by Boitler and Arnold. This exterior of this building is such, it has a lot going on. So you have like Greek revival things going on at one entrance. This is like a Moorish entrance on the left there. And these are like Italianate towers that you can see up there. Um, so there's a lot going on uh, with this building architecturally, but on the inside, you have the Abu Bakr Shrine's Egyptian room. I want to send a huge, huge thank you to the shrine that let me come in here and uh, take all of these pictures of the Egyptian room. This is where the shrine holds many of their uh, secret meetings. Um, I was like a kid in a candy store running around this place, so they were very indulgent of me. Um, this is a main shot of the room looking from the entrance, and you can see those Egyptian papyrus columns, all of the uh, figures dancing around there, um, all of the nice colors. close up on some of these. So this is the um, chairs at the far end there. And you can see we have this nice cavetto with the winged sun disk, those papyrus columns like I mentioned earlier. The hieroglyphics are especially interesting, the fake hieroglyphic figures. I think this is actually a depiction of the Egyptian god Amun. Um, I can't get close enough to it to actually tell. Um, and then you have these figures that are just dancing. Uh, these are carved into those chairs. So um, in, carved into a lot of the wood are these uh, scenes from uh, with all of this Egyptian symbolism. So this is a mummiform figure, a mummy, talking to the god Thoth, who has the ibis head there. Thoth is the god of wisdom. And you can see that winged sun disk on this chair as well. Oops. This is the altar where the, their Bible is kept, kept. And you can see, again, more Egyptian figures uh, carved into there, as well as these nice bell columns with either palm fronds or ostrich feathers on there. And the star ceiling isn't really something I associate with Egypt. That's really more of an English and Tudor thing. Um, but it's so cool that I, had, I couldn't not include a picture of it. Next, we have the Scottish Rite Temple over at 8th and Douglas Street, built in 1926 in the Prairie School style. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with this temple. Originally, it was built for the Knights of Columbus. You can see some nice jed pillars on the corners here. Um, the windows on both the first and second floor really give the appearance of niches, so those little grooves cut into the walls, um, especially here on the first floor. On the second floor windows, you also have fake colonnade. A colonnade is just a bunch of columns that are in a single row together. That's a colonnade, and you can see that very well here, even though the windows are blocked up in this picture um, on the second floor there. And to me, the Scottish Rite Temple just looks temple-y. I mean, I look at it and go, wow, that looks a lot like ancient Egyptian temples. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the Scottish Rite Temple and one of the temples at the Djoser complex out at Saqqara. Um, so one of the temples surrounding Djoser's step pyramid. And you know, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but you can definitely see the similarities. The Broadkey and Good Sight Jewelry Store over at 4th and Douglas, built in 1930 in the Art Deco style. This is no longer there. Um, but you can see it had, uh, along with this beautiful white facade, you can see some little pyramid details up along the cornice there and above the sec uh, third floor windows, or second floor windows, gosh, sorry. 
And right underneath of those windows, you can see this nice little step pyramid detail. The Badro building. Now, again, talking about architecture intent, there's no denying that when K.E. Westerlin built the Badro building at 4th and Jackson in 1930, he was going for Native American symbolism. And it definitely has Native American symbolism overall. However, art doesn't exist in a vacuum, and some of these elements also have Egyptian ties. For example, these uh, prairie flower details over the second floor windows um, look very, very much like a sun disk. Remember the Aten I showed you guys earlier on Tutankhamun's throne? The sun in ancient Egypt has been compared to a flower before. Here you can see a uh, flower earring uh, built into a shape of a sun uh, from Tutankhamun's tomb. So, yes, Native American, it's a prairie flower, but there's some Egyptian stuff going on there. Around the entrance, you can see these really cool fan details, and this is um, in one of the corners up along here, just cut off in this picture. You can see more fan details there. These may be lotus flowers, and like uh, this lotus flower inlay you can see from the Met, um, with the petals opening out like that. Or again, it could be an ostrich feather fan, like you could see here. Um, imagine this gold semicircle with a whole bunch of ostrich feathers sticking out the top of it. Um, very much a sign of kingship, so whenever I see fans, um, that lends itself to Egypt in my mind. And around the nameplate of the Vajra building, you see these nice little pyramids, uh, and they even have tiers, little steps on the inside of them. The Warrior Hotel, which is Sioux City's closest example to a ziggurat skyscraper. This is especially true if you see it from the side, like on the right side of this picture here. You have a mostly horizontal building with those tiers leading up to one big central tower. That's how we know it's a ziggurat skyscraper. Again, the details on this and like the terracotta are mostly Native American, but some of them do have Egyptian ties. For example, the hawk details that you can see here, hawks and falcons, of course, are very important to Native Americans, but the Egyptians had their own falcon, the god Horus, often shown in falcon statues, like you can see here. Um, one at a temple and one actually inside the British Museum. So very much like the falcon god uh, Horus, these forms. This is a shot of the lobby. And um, I have seen this picture like hundreds of times. And when I took, uh, when I actually went to do this talk, I took a very, very close look at this furniture. The table and the chairs end in these very interesting figures. And I can't tell what they are, if they're Egyptian, if they're African, if they're Native American. Um, these almost look like sphinxes to me on the table. Um, but it looks very much like what I'd see in Egyptian revival uh, furniture. For example, here's some shots from the Metropolitan Museum of Art of stuff that was actually built during that Egyptian revival period. And again, you can see they, uh, the chairs end in these figures, just like the Warrior Hotels. And these table legs have uh, those headdresses, just like you see in the Warrior Hotels. Ah, the Federal Building. What made me want to do this talk? Extremely Art Deco building over at 6th and Douglas and built by Boitler and Arnold. There's a lot of stuff going on here, so we'll kind of break it down one by one. First is just that general tiered shape. This again looks like Cal Calvary Cemetery's mausoleum. It is a ziggurat skyscraper that had its tower chopped off. Um, so you can see the tiers that would lead up to that central tower here. It just ends in a roof line rather than continuing up into a big skyscraper. The columns on the Federal Building are very, very fascinating. So you have the flutes through the main body of the column. Those are very Greek, and they were designed that way. But the original design called for these really interesting, like, square, fancy capitals. And they didn't end up getting built that way. They instead end in this cool kind of fanned line work that very much to me resemble papyrus flowers when they're open. So usually papyrus flowers are shown closed. Here you can see them open, like on this amulet. And that looks very much like the capitals of the columns around the Federal Building. Um, these columns are built in what we call stripped classicism. So it's Greek revival and Greek and classic architecture with all of the fancy elements kind of tossed out. Very Art Deco thing to do. Some other decorative elements you can see on the windows of the uh, Federal Building. That's not a super great picture of them, unfortunately. I couldn't get close enough. But there's little fan details that are little lily flowers inside of those squares. You can see little lilies inside of there. And there's more fan details around the staircase here. 
More overt Egyptian symbolism in the Egyptian room at the Oasis Tavern. This was at 3rd and Pierce Street inside of the Union Depot train station, and their second floor was a special room you could rent called the Egyptian room. Um, you see most of it along the back wall here. You can see those Egyptian-style figures. Um, this, I think, is actually a relief, a direct relief from uh, one of Akhenaten's temples, so Tut's dad's temples, because um, you can see the Aten sun disk in there. And uh, this matchbook has some its own Egyptian symbolism as well. Leeds Fire Department, Fire Department number seven. The building is still there, though it's no longer used as a fire department. Um, you have a general kind of tiered shape on one side of the fire department. But if you look close at the cornices, you can see these really, really cool sun disks. Very Egyptian. And finally, the Municipal Auditorium. Now, I know this opened in 1952, way out of this Tut Mania period. However, the original designs were done by K.E. Westerlin in the late 1930s. This is an extremely Art Deco building, one of Sioux City's best examples of an Art Deco building with its curved sized, so on and so forth. So I didn't really think there was any symbolism that I could connect to Egypt on the auditorium until I was out walking one day and went to the back side or the north side of the auditorium. And if you look up near the uh, top part where it says auditorium, you see these cool little pillars with those cut in brick coursework that to me look very much like a Jed pillar. And that is a quick little architectural tour of Egyptian symbolism, both here in Sioux City and across the world. I want to extend a huge thank you to the Griffith Institute out at Oxford. They gave me permission to use Carter's journals and his, uh, the original photography that you were see, uh, seeing in there. All of that was used by permission uh, from them. So if you love King Tut like me and are totally obsessed with it and could spend hours reading journals that were written 100 years ago, um, definitely check out their website. And here are some other sources that I pulled from as well. But thank you guys so much for indulging me and my geek outness. And uh, I'm happy to now take any questions you may have.